Hello, and welcome to today's Icelandic National League of the United States presentation. I'm Rob Olison, your host during this hour, and I'm glad you're joining us today. This webinar is part of the INL US mission to provide programs, classes, and other offerings that create connection points for Icelanders, people of Icelandic descent, and those interested in Iceland. For more information on the INL US, you can find it at our social media sites, our blog, and our website, inlus.org. If you're already a member of the INL US, we thank you. If you're not a member, I encourage you to join us. Your memberships help fund scholarships, grants, local projects, Icelandic language classes, and other initiatives. Before we get started, a couple of reminders. This program is approximately one hour in length and is being recorded. The recording will be available through the INL US website. As attendees to this program, you are muted. However, we welcome questions and we'll answer as many as possible during the program. To ask a question, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and if you're on a phone or a tablet, the button may be in the upper right corner, or you may need to swipe to find it. On today's program, we explore travel options in Iceland with one of Iceland's leading travel planning organizations called Hey Iceland. We will learn what to expect, some great places to go, and other tips to make a memorable Icelandic journey. So before we settle in on an itinerary and pack our bags, let's listen to special guest Sandra Gunnarsdóttir from Hey Iceland as she helps us envision our journey to Iceland. Welcome, Sandra. Hello, everyone. I'd like to start here by sharing my screen. Yes, hello, everyone. My name is Sandra and uh, I work for Hey Iceland. Uh, just for a quick introduction to myself, then I have been working in tourism for a very long time, since uh, 1990, in fact, when I started working in a guest house in the south, and then followed by uh, working on a kitchen bus, traveling around Iceland, following camping groups. Uh, we were cooking for the meals and preparing breakfast and so on. Uh, I then went to the guiding school because I found this uh, fascinating uh, business and ended up guiding for a couple of summers and after one of the summer seasons I ended up in a travel agency and here I am uh, having been for almost 20 years now in here at Hey Iceland. Uh, what I want to do in this webinar is to uh, start giving you some information about the eruptions we are having here. Um, then tell you a little bit about Hey Iceland and then give you a couple of uh, insights, tips, uh, and uh, hope that it will help you to uh, add to your knowledge about traveling in Iceland. Um, now I'm trying to change here. Okay, here it is. Here, it, this was supposed to be before. Okay, uh, this is what I'm planning to do, as you can see here. Uh, but let's go to this uh, matter here. Um, I guess that uh, over the last few months, you might have seen some news, um, some sensational, occasionally overblown media news of our volcanic eruptions. Uh, and this has understandably uh, made people nervous about visiting Iceland. And this sentence I put up there, uh, sums it up a little bit, the situation and the maps give you an idea of where that affected area is in Iceland. You can see it's a very limited area. And even if the airport is not uh, far from there, it's still not affecting uh, travel to or from Iceland. It's quite fine to come here. And we have been having those eruptions. And in the last past month, we have had those four small scale eruptions in that area and that fourth one is actually going on now as i speak uh, the volcanic system in this area is 
uh, active again after some couple of hundred years of being dormant. And we can actually expect uh, some regular eruptions in the future. Uh, and there is no re reason to believe, and our specialists tell us that eruptions in the future will be big and things are being monitored by our uh, specialist. And at no point, the airport in Keplavik has been at risk because of this. So it's quite safe to come uh, even with these eruptions. And I encourage people to look at our local info when it comes to these eruptions to find out uh, to get their information. And I, there is a web website, visit Iceland.is, which uh, has good information. And there you find, among other things, a video that I like that was recently made by a volcano specialist uh, from the Icelandic uh, Met office, explaining in short and clear way what is going on and what we can expect. And um, I encourage you to check them out at visit iceland.is and then come and visit, of course. Uh, from that uh, to a little bit about our story, our roots, Hey Iceland roots go back to 1965 when Air Iceland asked a couple of farmers to rent out the rooms to travelers that were interested in experience farm stay. Uh, this grew and slowly more farmers joined the trend. And in 1980, the Association of Icelandic Farm Holidays was established. And one of their goals was uh, to develop a sustainable tourism industry in rural areas of Iceland. Uh, in 1991, the Icelandic Farm Holidays Booking Office was founded. Um, and the plan was that it should handle the growing number of bookings and of course to promote the members. Uh, and their places all around Iceland. The shareholders were members of the association um, and all farmers located all around Iceland. Uh, at that time, uh, all of the members were farmers, but uh, with time that changed a little bit and more and more farmers uh, started focusing only on traveling services at their farms offering accommodation, meals, and some activities, and even tours. Um, actually, after I started working here almost 20 years ago, um, I regularly heard talks about the need to change the name from Icelandic Farm Holidays to something else, because uh, we sometimes had guests staying, uh, was traveling with us that wanted the true, true farm experience, but were not getting it as they were staying in a nice, guest house that was not at an active farm. And then we had people that were not considering at all staying at the guest houses or, or hotels in the countryside because they didn't want to stay at a farm. So it took some time, but uh, in uh, 2016, the name was changed to Hey Iceland. And at this time, about 40% uh, of the members of the association were offering tourism services that we're offering tourism services had the working farm. So it had changed a lot from the from 1991. And this word, this this name, Hey Iceland, was chosen carefully. Uh, hey is the word for hay, dry grass, and of course that international greeting with suits a travel agency. Uh, so we have there some connection to our roots in the rural areas. Today in the office, we have 27 employees. Uh, we offer tours abroad as well, but uh, also the tours here in Iceland. Um, we still stay well connected to our roots and the families running these guest houses and hotels in rural area of Iceland. And uh, still the biggest part of uh, the shareholders of Hey Iceland, they are uh, out there in the rural in the countryside, so the profit stays local. Uh, 
We are a bucket booking office for accommodation, subter tours, guided tours, and activities. And we special, specialize in tailor-made tours for uh, self drive tours and group tours. Uh, for example, for our self drive tours, we also offer the Hey Guide app, an app that is uh, includes the personal personalized itinerary and uses a GPS to guide people through uh, uh, the country. And it gives some extra information and uh, one thing that it has is also that uh, there is a possibility for people to send us messages to the office if they have some questions during the during the tours. And this is something that has been used quite a lot in the past past summers. We've been uh, using this app and has worked out well. And we specialize, as I said, in uh, group tours as well. Uh, including a local guide and uh, local driver, meeting uh, the people at the airport and even dropping them off there again at the end of the tour. Uh, we have taken care of all sorts of groups from family groups, um, um, friends, hiking groups, farmers groups, uh, photographers groups, and so on and so on. So um, it's quite different type of groups we've taken care of. Uh, you can also book on our website accommodation activities and, and day tours and easy to navigate there. Choose what kind of accommodation you want. Uh, rooms with private facilities, shared facilities, cottages and apartments. Uh, in what area, what time of the year uh, and so on and so on. So it's easy to navigate and book as well. Um, so sustainability is important to us and has been for a long time. We uh, were one of the first travel agency to put together a sustainable policy. And uh, of course the goal is to improve and minimize the impact we have on our surroundings. And we have uh, some ongoing projects now, uh, as you can see the carbon neutral flight for our groups going abroad. We are now working on uh, doing the same thing for travels in Iceland. Since 2019, we have offered self-drive packages with rental electric cars. Uh, we have that four days itinerary south, but others possible as well. Uh, we have our own fund called Hay Nature to use for planting trees, soil preservation and, and more. And here at the office, we reached the, our goal of 90% recycling in the office, uh, very little use of paper and so on. And, and um, we are proudly part of uh, Arkin. So we have an independent evaluation every year to keep us on our toes. Um, that was quick and short about us and then um, when preparing for this webinar, we got the question about best way to travel around Iceland. Um, and many travel around with rental cars and travel on their own. You have groups traveling, obviously, by bus, both private groups or uh, group tours where individuals are booking on scheduled departures. Um, from many places around Iceland, you can go for a guided day tour by bus or jeep. Uh, of course, many here from Reykjavik, but also Akurid, Isa further in the east, and even some guest houses and hotels in the countryside offer some tours. Uh, there is also our local scheduled bus route system, but um, uh, with a rather low, low frequency in departures, especially in the countryside, I guess it would need some big organization, organizing uh, to be able to adjust your itinerary to their uh, bus schedule. Um, over the summertime, there are also scheduled bus trips uh, without guide, just the bus trips into the highlands uh, on roads where you need a four-wheel drive vehicle. Um, those places are like um, for example, a bus into Thorsmörk and Landmöller here in the south and into Askja area in the north. Um, so actually it's an ideal thing for someone traveling the ring road, for example, on their own in a rental car. 
to go into those places, you would need a four-wheel drive rental car, but uh, maybe not necessary for the whole tour. So it's ideal to um, jump on one of those day tours to visit these sites in the Highlands. And also not having to worry about driving through a fort you might come across on these Highland roads. Um, about conditions on our roads, I took this today from road.is and um, that is the website of our road and coastal administration where you find conditions of the roads all around Iceland. As you can see, it's rather colorful now, uh, like a beautiful painting, really. Uh, and you have everything from green roads that means easily passable to red roads that are closed. And between there, you have you have the blue, uh, meaning spot of ice or being slippery. You have there on also a picture of the on of the content what each color means. And those small frames uh, covering the country there, you have there, uh, the temperature at the location. And you can see when I took this about just uh, uh, around two o'clock today, you can see what the temperature was in these areas at that time. And you see um, uh, the speed of the wind and direction and also how many cars have been driving their last 10 minutes and also last 24 hours. Uh, so this gives a good indication of how, how the roads are. There are also other signs there. For example, in the north, north uh, east, I see there a uh, sign for, uh, with a bulldozer. That means that the road was being cleared. And all these, uh, the ring round around Iceland and most of the roads leading up to it are kept clear. Uh, you have the Highland roads, they're all red. They, are, they have do not have any winter service, so it's all red. It will become green in the summer when they open. By probably end of June, early July, then you will have them all green. But how? But but they will have a, a sign with four wheel drive vehicle necessary to drive there. At, at this requirement, if you go in, on those Highland roads. Um, the roads, as I said, are kept uh, are kept clear when it's snowing. Uh, it happens. It does happen that they are closed down because the weather is bad, and then they're closed temporarily. Um, and something you have to uh, consider when traveling in winter. And this is actually information I use when traveling around Iceland. If going somewhere outside of Reykjavik, I would I will check this out. And there's um, on some spot you have webcams, web cameras where you can actually uh, you can see the conditions to have a visual of the conditions, which is quite good. Uh, you want to know the blue one, okay, it's slippery, but you know what does that? How does that look? And here on the next slide, I took a couple of photos today from these webcams. As you can see, uh, I, I took two from mountain roads. The one with uh, the more snow there is from the north. And then you have uh, from the lowlands that's not so snowy. But I have to mention it's snowing outside here now in Reykjavik. So should I be taking the looking at the webcams now? I'm sure it would be a little bit more snowy. But that snow might be melted tomorrow. Uh, and I maybe should mention as for future viewers that this is this is webcam use on 16th of April, 2024. Uh, and changeable. Um, also the question was traveling all year around Iceland. Some uh, hesitate in coming here. Uh, sometimes you hear that it's only dark in winter, but of course it's not that simple as I guess uh, many of you know. Uh, you have this photo there of uh, of the hours of daylight uh, during different months. And in October and March, you have a good 10, 11 hours of daylight. Um, and then you have the months between the, the day getting shorter until Christmas time about when the day starts to get longer again. 
and we see more daylight hours month by month, which continues until it being almost 24 hours of daylight by late June. Uh, traveling in October and or April, for example, or May, uh, you have a shoulder season prices, so uh, it's a, 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 bit, a bit less, a bit more afford, affordable, and uh, less travelers around. So, and also you have enough hours uh, of daylight with plenty of time to see and do what the day day's itinerary has in store. And even if into May you have you're getting closer to 20 hours of daylight, so plenty of time for long traveling days, if you feel up to that. Uh, so for winter travel in November to March, it is important to consider the hours of daylight and organize the visits according to that, um, just to avoid having, just to avoid being at the waterfall example, when it's getting dark. Um, so that's something to consider for winter. Um, and worth mentioning that actually February and March have in the past years become quite more popular in visiting in Iceland for winter atmosphere and sightings of Northern Lights. Um, to note maybe if you're not, if people are not traveling or not used to traveling in winter conditions, then it is important to come here well informed and realize that snowy, slippery roads are common and to be certain that you're up for it. Um, if not quite sure about that, then there are the scheduled, scheduled tours offered and day tours. And of course, if you're traveling with a small group, it's possible to organize a tour with a private driver uh, in a suitable vehicle for the tour. And as I mentioned, it, it does happen and uh, not uncommon so, uh, that uh, the roads need to be closed temporarily. So it's important to keep in mind that you have to uh, be open to adjusting the itinerary switch days perhaps, or do something alternative when traveling here in winter time. The summer months are from June till August until middle of end of September are our high seasons. And uh, if you were, for example, coming for bird watching or midnight sun golfing, then that is certainly the time to visit. Um, there are a lot of things to do and visit in Iceland. Um, but I like to I like to draw your attention to a couple of things, and they are rather randomly. Some of them I like a lot. Others have been pointed to me, or or some of my colleagues said would be interesting to mention. So uh, I will take you on a little journey to a couple of places. Uh, the first one, one of my favorites, is in Borgafjörður Eystri in the east. Uh, it's not by the main ring road, but uh, the detour is definitely worth a visit. Driving over that mountain road to get there with a splendid view as you come to the fjord and the small village of Bakagere. There are cozy guest houses there with rooms with private facilities, nice restaurants, cafes, and even a brewery. And if you're traveling during summer, during the puffin season, in May to early August, it is by far the child friendliest place to see the puffins. Um, if you see that photo there, there's a small islet by the harbor and uh, there are stairs up to it uh, where you have a view over the puffin colony. Uh, as opposed to other clips where you have puffins here that where you get nervous when going there for the children. There are also many great hiking possibilities in that area and uh, companies that offer guided walking tours. Um, going to the north now, to Stora Ausgersa, the farm. Um, if you would be looking for a farm stay, then this is a great place to visit in the north. They have an apartment to rent. Um, 
on a hot top, of course, that the guests can use. Uh, the guests have opportunity to get an insight into the day-to-day -day life of the farm. There's a horse rental there um, that goes regularly on tours, rent, uh, horse riding tours with up to seven persons at a time, one hour to two hours tours. Um, the family there has a small pub on the site and uh, apparently the farmer is a musician as well so he he held, holds he has con concerts sometimes there in his pop and back to east it's back and forth uh back to east to um uh, uh, again this is a place that is not by the main ring road does take some detours to head to the village of Eskifjörður with about 1,000 inhabitants. Um, where at the outskirts you find uh, this charming guest house in a historic building. Um, they, has, they also have a unique restaurant, restaurant and in this area as well as in Borgafjörður, there are great hiking possibilities and the family there offers guiding hiking tours. And of course, there's a hot tub there to enjoy some relaxing time in with a great view over the fjords and its surrounding mountains. Jumping to the south, uh, this is a hotel at uh, Farms Maratun, which I, I like. Um, uh, so sustainability is important to them. And much of what they produce at the farm is directly used for the guest in the restaurant called The Barn. Uh, they grow, for example, potatoes, turnips, rhubarb, um, and their beef, lamb, and pork that is served at the restaurant is from, the, from their farm. And during the uh, summer, they offer tree planting opportunities for guests uh, to to offset their carbon footprint. I've planted a couple of trees there, so I've done a little bit of that. And I'm going to take you back to the east. It's back and forth. And this time to Ophida Sedri, the wilderness center. Again, it's not a place by the main ring road. It takes a little detour, but I think it's worth it. Uh, there's a charming guest house there, so ideal to head there for at least one night stay, maybe two. They have rooms with private facilities and rooms with shared facilities. Also, um, made of beds in Balstone, which is a dorm built as many of the Balstone, which is a traditional area in the old turf houses we used to live in here. In Iceland, where people uh, worked and slept. Um, so it's sort of a step back into the past, uh, sleeping in that Balstova dorm. The Wilderness Center is located close to the Eastern Highlands, and they have a very interesting exhibition with that theme, where you step back in history, learning about travels through the Highlands in the past. Uh, they also one of many that offer day tours there, hiking tours, deep tours, and horse riding tours towards the highlands. Back to the south. Uh, this one is not by the main ring road, but still it's by the road going through our famous Golden Circle Road in the southwest. Um, it's a Lögavats Hedla Caves. And they are actually located between Thingvilli National Park and the Geyser area. And ideal if you like a local history stop. Um, there are two man-made caves that they have uh, uh, rebuilt to look exactly like they did uh, when people lived there. Uh, and that was only a century ago or so. Uh, it's a half, a half an hour guided visit they, they offer, telling the stories and struggles and happiness of the people who've lived there, which is, of course, at the same time, just uh, stories of 
local people a uh, century ago with a nice twist. And not far from Leot Hedla Caves is the geothermal bakery experience. Um, this is at uh, in Leot village at Fontana Baths, where you have a chance of a geothermal bakery experience. Um, guests are invited to to experience the geothermal bakery firsthand, see how it's done, and afterwards, of course, invited to taste the freshly baked rye bread. This is something you people can just do on their own, or just the, the geothermal bakery part, but also um, possible to visit Fontana Baths, relax there, uh, and make it a double joy of bathing in the warm water and seeing it used to bake bread. And on that subject, um, the very local thing to do is go bathing in our swimming pools and our warm pools and springs all around Iceland. And this website is worth a visit for those that like to do that. It has info of uh, all our swimming pools all around Iceland and all the warm bath possibilities and uh, hot top, hot springs possibilities. Um, actually, last couple of years, we've seen many great bathing facilities added to the bathing possibilities all around Iceland. Um, I guess the Blue Lagoon is one of our famous one. Uh, Mivat Nature Baths in the north, quite well known as well. But now we have others um, beside Fontana I mentioned. Um, there is the Sky Lagoon, the Secret Lagoon, the Forest Lagoon, and more. And uh, if it's it possible also to go to our swimming pools, something that we all do here as well in Iceland. And every village and um, town has one with hot tubs and some, some have saunas as well. Um, some of the swimming pools have a water slide, one or two, ideal if you're traveling with children. Um, so in short, you could arrange for a bathing stop every day during your travel here, if you want it. This is basically those few points I wanted to mention, but i like to end with this. Uh, for more info, uh, if there are, like each corner of Iceland has its marketing and info center. Uh, which has a website focusing on, the, on that region with all sorts of travel info, info from that area. Uh, see there, for example, I put up there, if you were traveling to the Westfjords, you could go to westfjords.is. And then you find all sorts of information about uh, where to go, what to experience, uh, where to go for meals and more. And there also on that website, you see there on the top of the of the website, you see links to the north, to the east, to the south, and other areas of Iceland. So you can trot along the whole country and uh, find out what they offer. Also, uh, adding that on our website heyiceland.is we have a blog corner with numerous blogs where all sorts of travel info can be found um, you see there uh, some of the possibilities there there are blogs on driving in Iceland uh, winter favorites all sorts of local tips fun facts info about waterfalls uh, TV series that have been filmed here and so on and so on um, uh, that's it from me actually um, I do hope that you this has added something to your knowledge about traveling around Iceland and and uh, hopefully uh, also giving you uh, an idea of what travel you need to contact when you when you travel when you plan your next travel to Iceland uh, well, actually, it's not 
quite over, even if my part is over, is because we're we're heading to the West Church to the family at Heitalr. So over to you. Well, thank you for that, um, Sandra. And so now um, we're going to turn our attention to the West Fjords, where we have a guest house uh, live, where we will find out what it's like to travel in that area with our hosts, Loa and Gisle. Go ahead, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for this uh, opportunity to be here. Um, we had some technical problems with our slides, so Douglas he is going to be our special assistant, I guess. Thank you, thank you. Yes, so um, this is our 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 place, Country Hotel Heidaler, uh, situated in the west fields of Iceland. And uh, my name is Loa, and um, I'm Gisle. My husband Gisle and. Uh, Heidalur is actually a small family-run business. It's only two of us and uh, my mother-in-law, Stella's mother, my Gisli's <laughs> mother. And, uh, but of course, through the years, there is a big group of people who have been helping us to make this all possible. Um, if we look at the next slide, then uh, you can see uh, where the arrow is, where, where we are situated in the West Fields. And uh, from Reykjavik, it's 350 kilometers drive. And um, the way to travel to the West Fields, to Heidalur, is actually by car. So our visitors, they are renting a car. And uh, mainly, mainly, yeah, mainly. It's quite complicated to take uh, to take bus to us. And uh, it's very popular in the Westfields to drive the, like we say, the ring road, the Westfields ring road. Uh, it's a beautiful area, beautiful mountains, and uh, when you are driving, you can see. You can see whales, and you can even see the puffin seals, of course. And, and the uh, big bird cliffs. Yes, and the big bird cliffs. So it's a real uh, nature paradise. And where you can, you can see the glacier on the top, Tranka Jökul, that's the national park, Hortstrandir. It's not allowed to drive a car there, so it's only you take a boat, and uh, it's a very popular uh, hiking area. Um, yes, I think we can just go to next slide. Uh, as Sandra told us before, she was talking about um, those uh, eruptions we are having now in Iceland. We even have one now ongoing. Um, the reason is, of course, that Iceland is situated on those two tectonic plates, the North American plate and the Eurasian plate. And uh, um, you can see that uh, Westfjord, which is actually the oldest part of, of Iceland, um, we haven't had any uh, earthquakes or, or eruptions, at least the last 10 million yes. years, actually. <laughs> so we are safe in the, in the, in the, in the West Fjords. Um, it was actually 700, 7, 1,700 and 84. Were the 84. Yes. When we had the big eruption. Lagagigar. In Lagagigar, which was actually uh, one of the reasons why people were uh, moving from Iceland to, to North America. And uh, people were also actually 
uh, moving to Westfjords at this time because there there was always food. You you had the the bird cliffs and the fishing grounds and the fishing ground. So it was at that time it actually was was easier to survive at the at the Westfjords. At that time, the fifteen percent or more than fifteen percent of the nation lived in the West Fjord, and uh, now it's less than two percent. Yeah. So we have more than one square kilometer per person. Yes, we have we have plen plenty of, of space, <laughs> and we are actually both uh, born in the in the south, but we took this decision at different times, though, to to move to the west roots, and uh, I think we never regret that uh, decision. It's a little bit different to 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 live there, of course. Someone would say that's maybe in the middle of nowhere, but it's a real, real paradise, I would say, actually. And uh, what we are going to do here, we are going to try to give you some insight in, in uh, how it is to, you know, what we are doing and um, how it started and, um, and uh, what our goals are in 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 Heidelberg. Mm -hmm. So next maybe. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, this is <clears throat> how it all started. And we had uh, uh, we bought this, this valley is too uh, uh, Yeah, it's it's the valley of uh, it's quite a big valley of 5 5000 uh, hectares. hectares and it's a river running down the down the valley so it was two properties first we bought one property and we were not thinking of anything else but then there were a farmer on the other side who told us well you should buy our, my side because uh, then you can have the river for yourself you know for the salmon and all that stuff uh, so we, okay we decided to do it <laughs> yeah the idea from the beginning was only to plant some trees and fish and to fish and to have some cottage that yeah. was actually the the reason for the family bought this bought this land so the first thing we did was uh, what you can see on this slide we took the old sheep house and we put plastic over it and made it to a greenhouse and uh, then we drilled for hot water and when we got the water, then we made one of the, uh, the places in the uh, to a swimming pool. And then we grow some plants around it. And now it is full of cherries and apples and grapes. And, uh, and we use that in the restaurant we have. So maybe next slide. Yeah, then the... All the houses were in really, really bad shape. So we were thinking of, okay, we should either we put them down or we try to rebuild them and do something with them. So that then we had this idea to make uh, uh, to a guest house. And at that time, there were no guests coming to the vestibule. And people <laughs> told us, where are you going to get some people to stay in these houses? <laughs> But somehow it worked. People came and now it's very popular. Mm. We're always fully booked. Mm. So if you go to the next slide. This was the restaurant in the beginning. You can see how the house is. This and is the old, old barn. This is the old barn, uh, which we tear totally down and rebuilt. And when I look at this picture, I really don't understand how we could think of it even to do it <laughs> it was so much work <laughs> but for some reason there were a lot of help we had a lot many hands who came and helped us mm. yeah so next yeah this is inside uh, mm -hmm. before it's the same uh, pictures taken from the same place it's inside the restaurant now and then we have the how it looked when we started. 
there were earth on the floor and uh, shit inside and <laughs> mm. yeah it was a lot of work well next mm -hmm. Yeah, so today we have um, uh, 19, 19 rooms and uh, it's uh, nine stand standard rooms which are in the old uh, old barn and, and cow house. Then we have in a new building superior rooms, deluxe rooms, two studio apartments and the, then we have three cottages. And uh, all our rooms have a private entrance and a private uh, bathroom. Mm -hmm. Next one. Next one. Um, those are the standard standard rooms. There you can see the uh, the old old barn and the cow house on the on the on the right right side. And then we can look at the superior room. So next, next slide. So um, yes, the the standard room they are eighteen uh, square meters, and those are the superior rooms. You can see they are in a new building with a view into the towards the the valley. And uh, the white house you can see there on the right side. On the photo, it's the where the swimming pool is within the in the greenhouse, and the superior rooms they are twenty two twenty five twenty five uh, square meters, and they are lighter, bigger windows, and uh, and better better view. And then we have the deluxe next one, next one the deluxe rooms. They are 20, 32, 30, 32, sorry, 32 square meters. And then you have a um, sofa, sofa, sofa corner. And you can see, you know, the, the entrance and the hall and, uh, and uh, the special and the private, private entrance. Next one. And the next one. So there you can see uh, one of our studio apartment. We have two studio apartment. They also um, have a view to the towards the valley, and uh, they have one quite big room and one small room for one person sleeping. And then you also have in those rooms you have a small kitchenette. Mm hmm. Next one. And the next one. So we have uh, three cottages. Um, two of them are close to the hotel. And uh, one of them is on the other side of the river. And it's two, around two kilometers uh, from, the, from the hotel. That's the one on the right side of the, of the, of the slide. And the cottages, they are different in size. Uh, the one in the middle has two, two rooms and uh, a small, small kitchen. And uh, yeah, tiny, tiny living room. And, but the one on the right side, it, it's bigger. It's for six people and possible to actually for 10 people. And then we have one also, the third one, we don't have a photo actually on this slide. It's, uh, it's also, it's for five to six persons. Okay, and the next one. So from the beginning, um, it was, we were, we decided that it would probably not be enough just to have a hotel. Um, we would need to have a restaurant and also some activities. So this is our campsite. Uh, it's quite big and it's really crowded at summertime. And uh, this is the river Kisli was talking about, which runs down the down the wall. Eh? And you can see Heidaler there on the other side of the of the river. So in the beginning, 
we only bought the land, you know, on the other side of the river, just like Isla said, just to plant some trees and to for fishing in the river. It's a salmon river and to have some cottage. Um, and if you, this river, as you can see, there is no bridge over the river, so you need to cross it. It's very different how much water is in it. If you manage to cross this ri river, then there is on the other side a natural hot spring, which is on mm, next, next. next slide. This one here. So this one has been there at least from the year 1200. It's always the same temperature, 40 degrees. And uh, it was even blessed by a bishop, by Guðmundur Góði. So people say it has a healing, healing power. And um, it's a very, very nice uh, relaxing bath, both in winter and, and, and summer. Okay, next one. So, yeah, we also have um, kayaking. Um, we do have uh, shorter and, and uh, longer trips. And uh, kayaking is very, very, what can we say? It's relaxing. Very, yeah, it's a very relaxing and uh, it's very peaceful. And we and see a lot of seals and yes, puffins and seabirds, other yes. whales. Yes. So those trips are, are actually very, very popular. And I think this is the most uh, relaxing, at least for me, you know, to be on be on on, on kayaking. Yeah. And it's quite, quite, quite popular. Like we said, it's both uh, shorter and uh, and uh, longer trips. And you don't need to have any ex experience. It's both for beginners and those who have some experience. And then we will show you our horse. Yeah, that's horses. Next one. next one. We have also um, horse trips. We have twenty five horses. Also, both for uh, beginners and uh, experienced. So you can choose if you. We make day trips. We day trips with fishing, day trips just up in the mountains or on the lowland. Mm -hmm. And then we have two hours trip and one hour trips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have horses for everyone, you know, yeah. for total beginners or those who have a lot of uh, experience. Ex experience and it's also a very good way of just to relax and enjoy the landscape and just to to enjoy the nature okay and the next one yeah yeah this is the hot pot we made after we made our second hole drilling hole for hot water then we got 47 degrees water and uh, then i went down to the shore and found some rocks and made these hot tops which you can see on these pictures it's out it's just outside, it's outside. the greenhouse where the swimming pool is it's on the same spot actually yeah. So maybe next one. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is the fishing. Uh, we offer fishing in the lakes up in the mountains. It takes around two hours, but there's big trouts there. This is uh, taken from the river, and I'm catching there a small salmon. Well, mm -hmm. maybe next one. Yeah. Yeah, this is the greenhouse. Yeah, this is the greenhouse we saw we saw before, and I don't know if you notice the in the you know there is a hanging rope here over the swimming pool. It's just a good example of how or, or what the small things can do do much, you know, because this rope is a very 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 popular, you know, to to play in the swimming pool, you know, on the rope. 
And in there we also have some hot tops and yes. and a lot of trees. A lot of trees. And this maybe. is, yeah. Next one, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, this is some of the thing we get in the in the greenhouse. Grapes and raspberries, plums, apples, cherries, mm, strawberries. And, yeah, yeah. And yeah. This, this we are all yes we are using this all for the for the kitchen for the for the restaurant yeah and making jams and all kind all kind of all kind of, of jams and yeah. also we use it for the desserts and for our yeah. cakes yeah yeah next mm -hmm. one maybe yeah this yeah, is this... just some photos from the summer at the greenhouse and now we have, of course, you know, we have spring there. We, it's not that green today. We have been cutting the trees, and um, but the cherries are starting to bloom, bloom, actually. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next one. And then in the valley, we have some greenhouses, too. And there we are growing a vegetable like the broccoli, cauliflowers, and uh, kale, and some other types of uh, thing we use in the kitchen. So we try to be very sustainable and grow our vegetable uh, by ourselves as much as possible. And uh, maybe next one. Yeah, this one shows also, this is from 1950, no, 1960, the first photo, and the other one is today. That's how the plants have been growing that we have been planting. There were nothing when we started. So now we have a uh, forest there, almost. At least, at least <laughs> it, in our... It will be. <laughs> <laughs> it will be one day. <laughs> our guests there sometimes, because when you are... You know, our horseback ridings, you know, the trips, you know, then you're riding through the forest. And sometimes our guests, they are laughing when we talk about forest. But uh, at least one day it will be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next one. Next one. These are few yeah. of our animals. Hey, Dollar is full of animals, all kind of animals and at winter time the yes yeah you you we already told you about the horses and those are the two dogs bouncy and loki they are also very popular because they like to join our guests on their hikings they really love love company and there you can see they are just waiting there for someone to go and play with them and on the right side you have um arctic fox um, we have an Arctic fox in Heidelur, which we have been feeding since he was very just a puppy. And it's a special um, opportunity, to, opportunity to see the fox and even, even feed, feed him. But he have, this one actually has been, we have been missing her actually for some time now. Yeah. So hopefully she will show up again. It happens some sometime but she's she she is you know living just wild she's and... wild you know but she just comes for food in a dollar maybe next one yeah, yeah. yes at, at winter time the horses are just working free so sometimes they are looking at our in our window where we live and uh, we will put the shoes on the horses now the 25th of april so then they are then we keep them in the in the field but over winter time they just walk walk around and there you also have our fox in in, in the middle in her, in, the, in her winter clothes <laughs> and on the right side this is our this is mr jacob our african gray congo parrot a very talkative and he is also very very popular especially among among uh, among children okay and the next one um our yes chicken. yes our chicken 
they are quite lucky because they get all uh, food from the kitchen, you know. So we don't throw any any food. It all goes to the chickens and, and the foxes and the dogs and, and the foxes <laughs> and the dogs and yes. And on the right side you have one. We have two cats. This is one of our cats, and he is enjoying life in in our in our greenhouse. Okay. Next one. And this is the restaurant, or a few of our things we make in our restaurant. Uh, we try to, as we told before, we, we use things from the valley, mushrooms, berries, a lot of blueberries and cranberries and uh, crowberries and uh, rhubarb and, well, we try to make as much as possible and use herbs from Icelandic uh, nature. And what we don't have, we try to buy from the locals. Yeah. For example, the lamb, lamb meat is from our, our neighbor. Mm -hmm. yeah. So next one. Yeah, this is uh, where we smoke our trouts or Arctic char, which we are producing. You can. It's just <laughs> yeah. It's just uh, yeah. It's just yes, yes. So we 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 smoke our trout and we also cure it. Cure? Yeah, yeah. Cure, cure, cure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe next one. Yeah, this is the aquaponic. We have aquaponic system which we have newly started, and this is how the process is. You know, the fish make the ammoniac and uh, or ammonia and uh, the bacteria change it to nitrate which goes to the plants and then we are growing lettuce and uh, a lot of other types of herbs uh, and we use that for the in our restaurant we show the next yeah, this is the aquaponic where we, we have some windows where you can see the fish through. And uh, there we have the greenhouses that are connected to the fish pond. Mm, maybe next. Yeah, so it's a circulation. It's a circle. Yeah. yeah. And here we have yeah the plants we are growing in the greenhouse. So the water is underneath. Yeah. And the water goes through and gets uh, clean and goes back to the to the fish. And we try to make the energy also uh, ourselves uh, to use for the pumps and for the things we need for all of this. Mm. Maybe next one. These are the wild berries and mushrooms uh, in the valley which we are using in our everything we do and we get a lot of exercise you know at, at this time of year to yeah, carry down the berries yes <laughs> from the from the hills maybe mm. next one yeah the water in Hedalur, the we made a mountain spring up in the or in the mountain, we take the water out of the out of the canyon and bring it to a uh, to a well, and then it goes down to our our houses. And uh, the hot water we drilled. We have drilled two holes: one that came out thirty-seven degrees, and another one forty-seven degrees. And then we pump it up to the houses and we heat everything up with this water. And we use it also for showers and hot tubs and everything. So next one. And this is how we make our electricity. We have some sun uh, pellets, which are obviously not working in the winter time, but uh, double it in the summer when we got all the lights. Uh, wind we have plenty of in Iceland and so we have small windmill and then we have the hot water holes the two of the holes you can see there and there from we pump the hot up the water 
Yes, mm -hmm. we are we are changing now the the we are yes yes buying a new new windmill. Yes, but yes, so those are the two. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we also have water that are running through a turbine. Okay, mm -hmm. next one. Yeah, okay, so um, so I hope we gave you some insight in what we are doing in Heidelur and uh, and what we are offering our our guest. Um like we said, the most, most, most common way to come to Heiteler is just by car. And uh, at winter time, it's it's uh, very important to use, like Sandra talked about, the road.is to just to know how the conditions are. Uh, for those who do not prefer to drive, you know, at winter time, then we offer some northern light trips. Heidelur is a very nice place to view the northern lights. And uh, if we go to the next next slide, then uh, we offer trips over the winter time. It's four nights, including day trips and different activities depending on the season and and weather conditions and we are picking up up uh, our guests in in Reykjavik so they do not need to need to drive and on the way to Heidelur then we are uh, visiting some places Hraunfossar um, and some hot spring Deildaratungu and we have some lunch on the on the way and uh, then it's Different, you know, depending on, like we said, on the season. If it's early, then sometimes it's possible to do some horseback riding, even kayaking. But in the middle of the winter, we we sometimes do ice fishing and uh, sometimes skiing. And we always... Snowshoeing. Snowshoeing. And we always uh, visit Isafjörður, which is the town of the Westfjords. And we, the guy you can see in the middle, it's a, it's a great museum, Osver, it's called, it's close to, it's by Bolungar Week. And he is telling us all about and showing us old boat and equipment, how it was in the old days to be, you know, the, the how the fishing men, you know, how the reality was in the old old days and um, and we also visit our our neighbors um, a sheep farm and a salt factory and uh, and on the left side you can also see a museum and uh, there we usually have some waffles and, uh, and coffee and in this house, you can also see how people were living in the old days. Actually, we can tell you that there were 26 people living in this house, <laughs> two, and it was two families. Um, so next, next slide. Um, yes, this is just some photos actually from our, from our Northern Light, one, one of our Northern Light trip. Uh, usually the the group they are never bigger than 16, 16 people so it's it's quite you know different how how big they are but but never bigger than than six, 16 um and there you can see you know how the horses are just you know walking around and following her on her skiing and Loki our dog of course is jo joining her so if you like animals, then then Heitaler could be the, the place for you. And if we have a look at the next next one, there you can just see an example of our our northern light. And uh, on the other two photos, we are hiking to the to the glacier. We always do that if the conditions are okay. 
it's a beautiful, very beautiful hike. Around to um, takes around two hours each way hiking. Next one. And the next one? Yes. Yes. So hopefully we manage to give you some insight in what what we are doing and uh, and uh, hopefully we manage to yes to it's actually not not complicated to travel to Heitalur and uh, Actually, the road is paved all the way except the last 12 kilometers. So hopefully we will see you in Hedalus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Loa and Geisley, for that wonderful uh, tour of your guest homes. Uh, it looks like a wonderful place to visit and... Uh, the food looks great. I'd like to sample that, if at all possible. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, but um, we have we have run over a little bit, but we do have a few questions that I'd like to give you all a chance to potentially answer. Um, and I'm not sure if this first one is about the retter. And uh, it's they're wondering, when traveling in September, what is the best resource to make plans for viewing the retter, the gathering of the uh, highland sheep, um, finding where to watch or even participate on a farm. I don't know if S Sandra might want to tackle that one or... Um, yeah, sure. Um, uh, retirnar, they uh, are, yeah. they, the sheep gathering, they are always at a certain date. And actually, I guess soon there's the date should be known, like where this uh, sheep gathering is held at what day and so on. Um, it's normally around 26th of uh, September. Yeah, but yeah. Sometimes different and dates, and different area. areas. Yeah. 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 So, and, uh, and I even think there's a, a web page somewhere. I don't remember now where you can see uh, when the next year's. Uh, sheep gatherings would be. So it's something you can actually have a look at and plan your trip around. Mm -hmm. um, well, wonderful. Maybe uh, maybe we'll need to do a little internet search to find out what yeah. website. Well, great. Thanks. I could, yeah. And uh, <laughs> another question we have is uh, when you visit one of the pools, the public uh, swimming pools. Do you need to bring your own towel? And what? How much does the average pool cost to use it? So I don't know who might. Uh, should yeah. I answer? Okay. Like, um, the uh, many of the bathing facilities and even some of the pools do have a possibility of rent a towel. Uh, the cost of the pools. Uh, the swimming pools is a little bit less than many of the bathing facilities, and 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 I don't know if Loa and Gisli have uh, how much it costs for a swimming pool. Um, in, in, I think it's in uh, our place we take fifteen hundred. Like twelve hundred yes, or we have. I'm, I'm in Reykjavik on the local place. Sure, I, th actually. I think I've heard, I mean, because usually when we are going, you buy a, a, a card where you can go multiple times. But if you're just going once, if it's 1200 or 1500, depending 1200 or 1500, depending on the swimming pools, mm -hmm. I think I'm not far off there. But the bathing places like Sky Lagoon and so on, they are more expensive. Much more. Uh, much more. Much more. It's not expensive. From, I not don't expensive. Know. Yeah, it's not expensive to visit the, you know, just the swimming pools, you know, the normal ones, you know. You know, the, it's, it's the, yes, like the lagoons who are, which are more expensive. Yeah, that can mm. be somewhere from, I don't know, 4,000 to 12,000 or uh, mm. yeah. anything there yeah. between. But the swimming pools definitely are one of the uh, least expensive activities to do and for, with children, for example, or just going there for all the hot tubs and relaxing. Mm. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Um, 
Another question is, how difficult is it to drive in the West Fjords in the winter? I know um, you talked, Lo and Geesley, about the difficulty, but um, would you advise someone renting a car and just driving up to the West Fjords in the winter? If you look at the road that is and yeah. are prepared for that, he could have to wait one or two days, then it's okay. Yes. If you have yes, if you have a have a good car and, and like Isla says, you have to be prepared that you need to wait somewhere if it's a snowstorm or closed road. And have spikes on the car. Yeah. But it's getting more common that people are traveling in the middle of the winter. And we even have campers, you know, in the middle of the winter. They are just parking on our park site, not at the campsite. And they are actually all year around, you know. Hmm. So it's it's getting more common and it's okay if you just, you know, know how to travel, actually. All right. So definitely use some caution, some planning and check those websites. Um, we have one final question and then we'll wrap it up. And that is about the current hotel or the current uh, season upcoming here. Are accommodations still widely available in Iceland for this summer or are they rapidly disappearing? You know, are there any parts of the country that are already completely booked up, for example? Um, I can maybe answer that. It's, uh, there, are, there is still availability and uh, I work uh, in the group division of Hey Iceland. And at this time, we see groups are cancelling because they don't have minimum number of of uh, participants. So hotel rooms are becoming available. So I think it, there is still an opening for coming this summer, summer definitely. And maybe lower, they can also tell about their booking situation. Yes, well, it's of course all always those months, you know, uh, July or June, July, August, they are quite booked actually but it's still though some dates available and uh, and uh, yes so it's yes we we still have some rooms available well great I'm sure that's... yeah <laughs> well that's good maybe we can still book in a, a trip this summer um, yes you should <laughs> try it <laughs> Well, I just want to thank you all, Sa Sandra, Loa, and Geesley, for joining us today and sharing all your expertise about how to make the most of traveling in Iceland. I know I've learned a lot, and uh, I've really enjoyed the hour. And I'd like to thank all of our viewers for asking such interesting questions. It's, it's great to be able to have all that kind of input. Um, before we close today's program, I do want to remind everyone that the recording of this presentation will be available on the INLUS website at INLUS.org. On the website, you will also find many other interesting video presentations that we've already done, as well as our quarterly newsletter and our event calendar where you can find listings for local Icelandic club activities. There may be an upcoming event in your area, so do check that out. And on our next INL US webinar, listen to a conversation with Iceland's ambassador to the United States, Bergdís Ellert's daughter, who is retiring this year after serving in the post since 2019. Ambassador Ellert's daughter will be joined by Ingebjörg Stefan's daughter, Iceland's honorary consul general in Colorado. That online discussion will take place in two weeks on Tuesday, April 30th, 2024. Details and the link to that webinar are on the INLUS event calendar. I want to again thank Sandra, Loa, and Gisle for the fine presentation this hour. And to our viewers, thanks for joining us on this webinar and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>